Hello, 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 beautiful people, and welcome back to another episode of the USL Show. Hope you are so excited. We have a lot to cover in this win. Um, lots of recaps, a lot of youth movement stuff that's officially here. Elena is back, and some people are confused. Um, but hey, John, how are you doing, man? Yeah, I'm doing really well. It, it kind of stinks that it's just two of us for what was an insane weekend. Like, yeah, this felt like maybe the week where we started to actually learn things about teams, I want to say. So, yeah, excited to get into it all. Speaking of only two of us being here, everybody go send some love to Ryan and Alan. Like, send mm -hmm. big love to them. I'm not going to share their news out in, you know, here, obviously. But, you know, go find them on social. Send them lots and lots of love. Um, I want to do something real fast, and this is a this is different than normal than just our normal patrons, which includes you know John Hunter, Frank Anthony, Aaron J, Christopher Cohn, Harry Austin, John Fuller, Michael Fuchs, Joshua Duder, Noah Telfer, and Alberto Aguilar. Thank you guys so much for supporting us, and in that part of your support is going to be getting us to our first ever on location show. Um, we can't really announce where we're going yet because a part of that is figuring out how to kind of get there. So we say this at the end of a few shows, but we're going to put it up here bright and bold. We are for sale. <laughs> um, <laughs> we are looking for a sponsor. I mean, I kind of said that jokingly, but like we're looking for a sponsor if someone has a company that wants to get something read on, you know, uh, I, I guess a somewhat national audience, like it's, you know, it's there. If you want to support us, we are looking to travel. We're trying to get five people traveling, which is a lot. And even if it's only just a little bit coming out of our pocket, we, as long as we can get most of this covered, we will be good to go. We'll share more about that once we kind of have that. If you are looking for us, our work email is the USL show at gmail.com. It's in the description. Um, if you're listening to podcasts, it will be there as well. Um, please check that out. Um, we would love to actually get this show rolling and on location, which we've been waiting to do for a long, long time now. So all that yeah, said, we can be bought. We can be bought. We're not afraid. Um, order for tonight's show. I want to just go ahead and hop right into it. Atlanta, well, Roswell, Roswell, Georgia was announced as a Super League contender or is was awarded a Super League team, but that's not the part that caught people's eye. It was the fancy gold letter beside it, or I guess like symbol, it's a star, the championship as well. The USL going back for the first time since Atlanta United 2, which people were very excited on the Super League front, but are left very confused on the championship front. What are your kind of thoughts about this, John? Yeah, I mean, I want to start out with the Super League team because no matter how you come at that team, that's going to be a huge deal for the league. Atlanta is a market that has shown it can support the men's game at an extent that's basically unmatched in America right now. So if you can transport that support to the Super League, that can be a real boon for what this organization is trying to do. That can be the anchor tenant for this soccer-specific stadium that they're trying to set up in Roswell. So everything about that, love it 100%. I think from the championship side of things, it can be thornier. There is an argument that, okay, you're putting this team out in a semi-affluent suburb. If they do come with this stadium project that really makes it a can't-miss fan experience, maybe you're able to get enough butts in the seats to make it all work. Given the fact that this is a growing sport, you can siphon off some of uh, the suburban contingent that's going for Atlanta United. But I do have my concerns that you're entering one of the markets that's really the spine of Major League Soccer right now. Given how things went at the end with Atlanta United 2, which is so apples and oranges, it hardly even begs comparison. I do have some qualms, but overall, I'm just so happy about the women's side that I want that to be the focus, probably. 
Yeah, so I was a little bit has not hesitant, but a little bit confused um, on a bit of location. Now Roswell, I know is very close to where my wife grew up, so like I know that area well. But I kind of got my sides mixed up because they're not too far from where the Silverbacks played, like at all. I think it's like a twenty minute drive at most. So I was thinking that maybe they would just kind of go to silverbacks park and do that and be like a spiritual successor which it does that's obviously not the plan you mentioned a soccer specific stadium i want to say this though people and, and we get this uh moment in the chat uh edwin kind of talks about the men's not felt miserable <laughs> i i understand people saw the attendance i do but if you ever made your way down to atlanta united to to watch the games at Kennesaw, genuinely, some those are some of the most passionate fans I had met. There were real two United fans, and it wasn't just a little like they had drums. They did the whole thing. Like they were passionate about that group. There are people that want to support more than just Atlanta United, and as big as Atlanta is, I think some people don't fully realize how big Atlanta is. Atlanta is a massive, massive, massive like city um i think the decab county is bigger than like that county is like bigger than the metro or like or like atlanta is bigger than where birmingham is like the county that metro the metro is one of the five or six biggest in the country like if you're gonna have two cities in any market atlanta is on the list the very short list of cities where you should try it right and the, the where this is as well is that I, it might be easier to get to than Mercedes Benz. Mercedes Benz for Atlanta United, it's it's a beautiful facility. I get it. I've been there several times. It's wonderful. It's not the easiest to get to, and so I wonder if that this is going to be just more accessible for people. This is just going to be a more accessible place. And if you say, well, only you know, 3,000 people will show up. But it's like, well, that still puts them as one of the better attended teams in the league. Yeah, it's like, I mean, if you look at the numbers of some of the teams that have joined the league, like, it's not necessarily that far from the standard right now. I yeah. think from the league-wide perspective, what are you gaining from getting the Atlanta television market at the same time? Like, that's we're in a place where that matters going forward for the USL from a, a from a corporate uh, television from sponsorship. So there's a lot at play here. Like I think my first reaction is I have questions, but I think the strategy behind letting them do what they're doing is sound. I think a big part of this is obviously Super League, right? And I this is a genuine question. Are they allowing people or like cities to be only super league because other than Dallas Fort Worth, they're the only one that don't have an active team, but they will also have franchise rights. So are they only attacking cities that have current like franchise rights given out? Because uh, it feels like they're trying What's to create the deal with Fort Lauderdale. I mean, technically, I think that's St. No, wait. No, there's, a, right? there's a separate Tampa Bay team, but they're not even owned by the same group that owns the Rowdies. So, right. Yeah. But yeah, Fort Lauderdale is distinct, I think. Okay. I mean, yeah. Uh, DC is only super. Technically, that's. Right. Well, you could say that's Loudon. Loudon adjacent. I yeah. think that. I think that might be loose. It's weird, but I'm excited on Super League part because I, it's mm -hmm. pretty well documented that Elena has been craving an NWSL team and kind of the Southeast, uh, that part of the Southeast has been anyway. And Arthur Brank kind of, uh, you know, drug his feet on it. And then it now it's a lot more expensive to get an NWSL a lot more expensive. It's a lot cheaper to get into the cha uh, into the Super League right now for it to be at you know the same level. It feels like this is a on the women's front 
like trying to win a market that should have had one a long time ago? It was hard for me not to look at both legs of this from a very soccer wars perspective right away, just because Arthur Blank has had the talk about, okay, we're going to bring an NWSL team here at some point, just because the men's side, like the obvious conflict there, the fact that the silverbacks once upon a time were in the market. I think it's important to look beyond that and understand like, even if there is an NWSL team playing at Mercedes Benz, I think that this team, if they're on the ground first in Roswell, doing what they do with a high level for the fan experience, that has a really strong argument for coexistence, given the Division One, Division One parity, given everything else in that vein. So, but again, I know I keep drilling out, but really bullish on the Super League side of this. Me too, especially if they can get the wheels really going on this and granted this would be way too fast i think but let's assume that they can really get it going really get it going atlanta's hosting part of the she believes cup like soon if they can put some feet on ground and get like super league to atlanta around there like even if it's just outside the stadium set up somewhere it's a little something to get the get the ball rolling on what's specifically a women's soccer group. That is a women's soccer crowd to go watch a women's soccer match, international match in Atlanta. Say, hey, professional women's soccer is coming to Birmingham. If they can somehow pull that off, boots on ground, I think that's a big win for the league. No, 100% agreed. Like, there's going to be plenty of runway for this team to have these opportunities. Because Atlanta is that major market that is going to have major opportunities to kind of uh, host the USWNT, really sell the game to fans of women's soccer. So uh, you kind of mentioned soccer wars, and I didn't really include this on the order for tonight's show, but I kind of want to talk about it. Uh, The time where the USL was the bad guy, uh, the big bad wolf, if you will, in the USL uh, the Red Wolves have announced postponements that are leaving Omaha like a month without playing a game because of changes and upgrades to the pitch and upgrades to the stadium, which I think there's a lot of interesting fronts on this one. If you're Omaha, you're obviously rightfully upset that you're not playing for a whole month. You're trying to find friendlies if you can find them anywhere to try to stay match fit. Um, if you're Chattanooga, you're saying it's not our fault. Like we're trying to make the stadium better. We're trying to build our infrastructure, you know, don't crucify us because we're investing, but this still just ends up with Chattanooga once again, looking really bad. If you're Chattanooga and what they cited in the press release was, okay, there has been a lot of inclement weather. We couldn't get the grass properly installed in the way that we wanted. Like, yeah, you probably needed to have contingencies in place and understand that this needs to be done a little bit further behind. No one else in the league is really ever having the same problem, and it rains in every market outside of Phoenix, probably. The thing for me is that Chattanooga FC started playing home games a couple weeks ago. They're going to have a month of doing that in MLS MLS Next Pro, showcasing the fact that we're the same level as the Red Wolves now. Why not come watch the soccer that's being played? From a competitive standpoint, like stinks for Omaha, stinks for the Charlotte Independence. The Red Wolves are going to have pretty mean uh, fixture congestion, uh, congestion later on in the year, right? Like, this is a team that did add a lot of depth over the winter, but with the League One Cup, or the Jägermeister Cup, rather, Thank they're going to have just a lot work. to do late in the season, which, I mean, that's not going to play well for a team that was looking to have a comeback in 2024. I, I think the biggest thing that you mentioned there is the fact that their direct soccer wars counterpart, the thing that they kind of tried to kill, is yeah. alive. And you know what? Like they in their first MLS Next Pro match, they pulled almost five thousand people. Like, I think, I think there was a world where 
Red Wolves ownership was kind of hoping that the move to MLS Next Pro would be the death blow, and they're still going just as strong. And now you're giving them a full month of playing at the same time for them to once again be the only show in town for a full month when that could have been avoided. And, you know, there's a little bit of me that says, you know, soccer karma, like the soccer gods kind of find a way. But also, it, I'm just, I don't, there's going to be a lot of crapping on ownership today. I'm just going to let that be known. Um, but if you're going to like start a soccer war, <laughs> you better be ready to fight it. It's not as simple as USL big and shiny, your MPSL team bad. You, you know, we're better than you because you built, all they've done is shoot themselves in the foot. I can't think of the last time Red Wolves have done something, and I'm like, good for Red Wolves? Like, they're doing something really good? I mean, they're building around their facility. When I went up there, they're they're really building around that area, and it's really nice. It's really cool that they're building apartments and stuff like that. Like, they're trying to build up that area, but other than that, it's just constant just stepping on rakes. No, it feels like everything since 2022 has really gone wrong, like a real Murphy's Law situation where even when they're trying to make the right decisions, things are just getting in their way. And I mean, this is another example, right? Like, say it is the just that rain has been the problem on the pitch. That's unreal. And it's yet again, just terrible luck for the Red Wolves. Yeah, I want to, you know, unless you have anything else on this, I want to move on to the new initiative that the USL is doing. So the new initiative, um, and by the way, Red Wolves, yeah, they won the Open Cup first time they've ever done that. I mean, good for good for Red Wolves for winning in the Open in, Cup. When, by the way, what was an insane game where they yes. went down a man, blew, almost blew the lead. It took out of time, like just crazy stuff for the Red Wolves. I mean, they kind of keep the old like League One thing of if a team gets a red card, they're still going to win because League One. I mean, what yeah. year was that? Was that 2022 when like teams who went down a man just yeah. kept winning? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Stupid. Um, the USL has said that they are starting a new initiative where they are allowing um, the addition of two players uh to the home club's match day roster um and that is the headline i i kind of wish that they would have talked about that more than just saying youth movement in the headline but basically if it is a youth player if they are on a standard player agreement um the club is allowed to allow up to two players that are 17 or younger or a player who has signed an academy agreement, the home club is allowed two of those players, regardless of the player's age at the time of signing the player agreement. So you'll have a follow-up story on this in the morning. Thank you, Nicholas Murray. Hashtag subs subscribe to the Rondo. Like, please actually do that. It's really good stuff. Um, mm -hmm. I, there's been a lot of discourse on this. I love it. I know that some people were like, this is just another way for them to skirt some like salary rules or whatever, like y you still have to pay appearance fees and anything like that if they play. So like there's that, but also some people and kind of br rightly brought up uh, Brandon McCarthy brought it up himself. Yeah. This feels like it kind of favors the home team a little bit and yes, like it does, but and I think this is also this, my own opinion Child labor laws are wild and they're not consistent from state to state. And so if a player is on the bench, they may not be able to travel to another state and be on the bench. I have a feeling that this is the way to kind of just broadly say the home team can do it because you know your own state's child labor laws, <laughs> you know? Um, and yes, as we always say, please play the youth. 
on the uh, child labor laws thing, I don't know if you were seeing the Tom uh, Bogert tweets about <laughs> New York Red Bulls had that 15 year old kid who yeah. couldn't, <laughs> he couldn't even be on the bench past like six o'clock or nine o'clock yeah. at night because it violated six, six New PM. Jersey's 6 p.m. because it violated New Jersey child labor laws. Like, if you want to know why maybe it's a little bit difficult to have the academy kids travel, case in point right there. But, I mean, overall, on, in, on the home away thing, like, sure, if you have two teenagers on the bench, in theory, it helps you out. Those aren't players who are going to be used as tactical subs to change a game outside of the most insane wonder kid you've ever seen in your life. Like, I understand the sentiment of having warm bodies on the bench functionally it doesn't matter competitively where it does matter is when you are a home team who's up a couple goals late you can throw on these kids for 20 minutes and say go get some run out get some professional experience show yourself off because that's the whole point of the youth movement right we want these kids in the shop window showing off that they can compete against grown men so they can be sold on and have better opportunities for themselves and benefit their club in the process this is yet another initiative that really benefits that aim. Um, real quick, uh, Pope. Yes, we will talk about, I kind of want to get into that at some point. I think that's an interesting discussion. We'll get to that. I think in a little bit, um, his question of are more teams just playing a three, four, three. We'll talk about that. Uh, Joshua Winder. Good example. Uh, the biggest thing to me, and I need to check in the weeds of the rules. So I might just be talking out of it if you know what I mean, mm -hmm. but I don't think that players who are not on the match day roster can even go on the field before the game and like warm up with the players. So, or you know what I mean? So like that's, that's my understanding. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot that comes with being a 15 year old and getting touches during warmups being beside the 32 year old who's been doing this for their entire life and seeing how do they do rondos? How do they do one touch passes? How do they do this when they're preparing for a game and understanding the rhythm and the flow of a game? Just being a part of that is a lot. That is so much of learning how to be a professional is, I mean, I watched it and I'm not going to air out the, the kid it was or what team he was on. But there was a kid that I watched Legion play two years ago now, and he was a 16-year-old kid who had traveled down uh, for a game. And during the warm-ups, he was running 110%, like just putting in so much effort into the warm-ups. And he came on at the end of the game, and he when he came on, he was already gassed. Like learning how to pace yourself during a warm-up, that's stuff that you have to learn how to do. It sounds so stupid because you've done it since you were 12, but the first time you play as a professional, that adrenaline's crazy. Just learning how to pace yourself is just so important on being a professional. No, 100%. It's having that extra time that you're sanctioned to have now around professional athletes in the context of professional coaching that when it adds up over the context of 16 home games, 17 home games really makes a difference for a young player. Yeah. Do we want to go ahead and get into uh, some of the matches that were? Yes, please. All right. Let's first start off with the USL Tactics Show, as always. This one uh, came out today with our favorite, Charleston Battery. Hello, and welcome into the USL Tactics Show, where today I want to talk about Charleston's throttling 4 nothing win over New Mexico United and the way that their press completely denied New Mexico joy in the middle of the pitch. As you can see on the heat map there, Charleston was unbelievably effective at denying the central spaces. And you can see that breakdown here. The battery typically run a 4-2-3-1, and it was no different on Saturday night. Notice the way that the three attacking midfielders and one of their central midfielders, deeper from the pivot, step up to deny New Mexico any access to the midfield. New Mexico is a team that tends to use Marco Micheletto and Zico Bailey as the real nexus of their offense. Those two central midfielders drop deep to get touches and create joy. But look how Charleston pressed. They had their wingers take very looping, arcing runs that denied the midfield and drove play to the sidelines. Again, refer to the heat map. This team had no joy in the central areas. 
Moreover, Charleston was able to turn press-based uh, joy into offensive chances. Because New Mexico was turning over the ball in dangerous areas, Battery then got the ball in more attacking-minded areas. You saw it on the Nick Markanik goal there. You're seeing it again here, where the Battery are able to force a turnover by taking those looping, arcing runs that deny the midfield areas. This is a virtuous cycle that we saw through much of last season, of course. This team is built upon the press, and that's really Ben Pierman's specialty in instilling it. Look at the way they counterpressed as well. Here, Charleston loses the ball. They're able to get a central midfielder, Aaron Malloy, in their left back, Nathan Dos Santos, to win the ball back, again, in a dangerous position, and then work into Arturo Rodriguez for what ought to be the goal of the week, just nasty stuff, but again, built on the defense. This team is so good going both ways, and it's because of those principles that Ben Pierman is able to instill. I want to hop in with just this question, and it's not Charleston directly. I'm not saying the result would have changed, but did we ever find out why Tim Bacchus didn't play? I was asking someone about this a couple around Monday. I didn't really find out an answer. I, I'm just unclear with the travel of it all. I know they've got Phoenix coming up this week. Probably just had a knock in training is what I'm assuming. But yeah, and someone who knows New Mexico can uh, figure that one out. Yeah, I mean, that one was that one kind of blew my mind because, I mean, Tambakis was on a heater, like an absolute heater. And I'm not saying that changing your goalkeeper automatically means that you give up four goals. I mean... But with the run that he was on, you feel like a few of those probably get saved. Um, and just organizing the defense. So, you know, that's uh, that's just something to kind of talk about. But this, by the way, that one was for you, Ben Clemens um, and Del Schaefer. We love y'all. Um, I One thing I want to really touch on with Charleston is – okay, I don't want to get caught up in the moment. I, this is week three. I get it. They, as a fan of a team in the East, they scare me more than they did last year. I think they have more weapons in the arsenal this year. Like, not to say that this team wasn't really good and had a very <laughs> varied attack last season, but when you think about the depth in the attacking line, the fact that you can just bring someone as explosive as Juan David Torres off the bench, the fact that there's that active competition between Nathan Dos Santos and Josh Drack at left back. So much uh, energy, so much skill in the central midfield. The striker spot with Conway, with uh, MD Myers, they feel deeper everywhere on the pitch, and it's giving Ben Pierman more weapons. There's not a coach in the USL who's better equipped to make good out of that skill, the skill that he has on this squad. I know that I like. I think Louisville has taken up a meaningful step forward. We're going to get to some teams that are contenders, but Charleston, man, they are just amazing. The one thing that I I think I said when we did our championship preview show was that to me the key piece in this entire Charleston team was getting Mark Segbers a full off season. Yeah, like. <laughs> I mean, he he's a big deal, and, you know, it gets dropped into the chat. Aaron Malloy is ridiculous. We've been saying it since he was in Memphis, obviously, but he did everything for Memphis last year. And it, Ben Pierman getting him back is just disgusting. <laughs> You talk about Segbers, when they uh, traded for him at the end of last season or signed him from Miami, they had to play him as an inverted left back. So, like, he's a right-footed guy, and he can he can play the left back position. Having him on the stronger side has been immense so far and fits in with the way that Pierman wants this team to play. Really big deal. Yeah. Uh, in general, for New Mexico, I'm not too, too worried about New Mexico. That It just kind of... That felt like a game that kind of was what it was. I don't really feel too worried in the sense because they've already shown us two good results. 
You know what I mean? Like if is the is the Pittsburgh win a good result at this point? That's what I'm. That's how I'm reassessing at this point, just given what we've seen from the Riverhounds. A hundred percent. But going into Rhode Island, that's fair. that. I mean, I, that's actually that's a very good point. Yeah, I I'm willing to take. I mean, three points are three points, right? Mm-hmm. In Pittsburgh, they were what they were, but also going into Rhode Island was what it was. I. I'm willing to overlook this. Now, if the next game we get just leaky defense just over and over and over again, silly sloppy fouls again, I might start to put the finger over the panic button. But yes, just week three, this doesn't feel like anything for me to panic about yet for them. Phoenix is going to be a good test, just given the way that Rising can pick you apart with so much attacking talent, Panos, and in between the lines. So I think if they can not shut down Phoenix, but stem the tide offensively. That's probably the barometer I'm looking for for New Mexico. I want to have a quick, quick conversation um, about Vegas and El Paso. Um, Vegas gets their 1-0 lead, or gets their 1-0 win. And maybe I'm wrong here, but first win under Bautista. And, you know, it's a it's a scrappy 1-0 win. And want to be happy for them. Um, Rico Rosarena looked like the happiest human of all time. Um, that was that was just fun <laughs> to watch. Um, the El Paso side can't be ignored. Five matches in twelve days with a friendly, which is so cool that they were playing against their sister city right across the border but they could not have put it at a worse time in the schedule <laughs> at all. And a lot of this is compounding with the fact that they didn't get good results. If they had gone and gotten two wins, you know, played their friendly and then lose the, you know, Las Vegas, I feel like we could say had a, a little bit of fixture congestion, but whatever. This early in the season for you to play five matches in 12 days is just malpractice it's like you don't care about the player's health when the th- i mean the thing with the friendly both of the clubs sharing the ownership the fact that el paso is still waiting on a couple of players to come over on loan that i haven't quite got their papers figured out yet and el paso really has been running what i would call like a 15-man rotation like they're not using the depth in that squad to much of a degree at all Someone like a Lucas Stoffer who's going end to end at the wingback spot, like I feel bad for that guy's lungs right now. And especially given the fact that El Paso has some tactical holes right now where they're getting played over constantly into the channels, the fact that they can't consistently create down the middle, it's all kind of coalescing into this snowball effect that they're really suffering for it. And, and credit to Las Vegas for getting that win, by the way systematically i think dennis sanchez is making the right changes that they need to make i think that they really put a priority on the defensive solidity on the wings when you're putting joe jow and gausu samake there those are guys who have played fullback in their careers like they still have the speed to get upfield do damage alongside Corey bennett but there's a real two-way effect to when you have them versus like a solomon asante who while he's still a great player he's not necessarily that defender And I think it was totally the right call to kind of stem what the locomotive do. But El Paso came in weak for the reasons we've delineated, and Las Vegas took advantage. This is kind of where I want to talk about the um, kind of the conversation that got brought up earlier with the 3-4-3. This was, you know, El Paso has been running a three-man back line. And I think of the three, I think three of the Four USL teams they've played so far kind of typically run a three-man back line. Um, if I'm just kind of remembering off the top of my head. Um, there's a lot of three-man back line. And a lot of that comes down to the fact that Europe, you started seeing a lot more of it. And as all things go, tactics kind of work its way down. Like <laughs> it, is tr- it is trickle tactical economics, basically. It starts up at the top and it slowly works its way around and works its way out. And a lot of times what you have is a 
probably a fullback who has lost a step and they get to go play in the back line and they have someone who is a really good ball carrying center back who can carry the ball up and down, who maybe is a midfielder, kind of like what we were seeing out of Pittsburgh with Danny Griffin. Like that's what they wanted Danny Griffin to be was this ball carrying center back. It's not quite working, but that's what they wanted out of him. That's what Bob Lilly wanted. Or you could get, you know, look at your Birmingham side, or I think even um, uh, Lexington, if they're playing them, like Corrales. Like, that is a fullback who has kind of maybe lost a little bit of a step, but still good with the ball at their feet, can get up and down the pitch. And it allows your wing talent, which there is a lot of it in the USL, and I think that's a big part of it. There's a lot of wing talent in the USL. You let your wings do their work. You let them eat a little bit. It just ends up being a very free-flowing system, typically. And also, when teams get their goal or two, it allows them very easily just to park the bus and don't allow anything. I I think the interesting thing is that if you like look team by team, Birmingham and North Carolina are the only two teams that have made the switch this year. But that's what that's made the difference to get you over the 50% mark. Half of the league essentially right now is using a back three. That feels like a pretty significant marker at this point, right? And it's the reasons you stated. It gives you that extra set of feet when you're building out to have that possessive control. We're seeing more and more USL teams every year avoid the long ball, really try to kind of play with possession in mind. At the same time, if you want to get aggressive with it, those outside backs can push up, really compress the pitch, support a higher press. So there's benefits every way to kind of modernize the style of football you're seeing in the USL. I think it's important. And I think that it shows that there's a real sophistication to the coaching in this division. Like, I mean, look at Kano Smith, who's coming in and yeah. using a really progressive three, uh, four, one, two shape with Rhode Island, pressing high, controlling the game with that model. He's not going to choose a shape that's outmoded. And I mean, that's the reason why you're seeing it across the board. Um, Connor Davis kind of puts this in the chat. Lucid switched to a three back. It scares me. Lucid's kind of always been a three back. They may announce in the past, they may have announced it as a four back, but Tyler Gibson was a third center back when they were in possession. Like he dropped in so deep while I think, yeah, go ahead, go ahead. Well, I was going to say, like, whenever you had, like, Oscar and you had Dia really bombing up the wings, yeah. like, I mean, Gibson was sitting so far deep. You were essentially running a three-man back line, even when they weren't. Now, when they went to a proper three-man back, like, Gibson was getting up. Like, he was getting up there, and he was very – he was wonderful with the ball at his feet. But whenever they were running that four-man back, he was just dropping in constantly. Well, that's where formations are kind of a crapshoot. Like Louisville was going to be a back three team when they possessed no matter what, even if they defended with four defenders and then that holding midfielder. So like at a certain point, it is academic. But I think the fact that you're just seeing more teams kind of move players around in that way, just a further good sign. Uh, what Popes uh, uh, puts into the chat or what Birmingham do- is doing with Enzo. I don't know what Birmingham's doing with Enzo. <laughs> He's a CDM center back striker. Everything you Classic. want a man to be. <laughs> a normal combo. <laughs> <laughs> Let's go ahead and move on just a little bit um, real fast. I would like to get to Orange County versus Miami. Um, John, start fathoming. They're getting results. <laughs> yeah, you know it's good when I get the quote tweet from Miami FC to tell me to start fathoming. <laughs> <laughs> I, I I do think like we've praised No Serino a lot in the early stages of the season because he's got this team so well drilled. It's a it's a more sophisticated style of soccer than I initially gave them credit for. Like in that first game, he came out and wanted to just play over the top of Colorado Springs, and that made sense for that game. Against Orange County, Miami barely played the long balls. They weren't route one. They really wanted to go to that Orange County press up. And when the moment struck, they were going to hit into Alan Gavilanis because he is unreal in transition. But that wasn't the only way that they could create chances or break through. Then you get into the defensive block. They've got that. I'm calling it a 4 4 one, one. Call it what you want. It's really compact. It's really hard to break down. 
Orange County kind of just living off of set pieces in a lot of ways at this point in the year, but you'll take it. Very cool for Ashton Miles to get uh, the goal in that game. I've talked to Nicholas about this, in fact, and he highlighted it in his young player spotlight. Miles is a guy who's homegrown, came up in the OC system, as opposed to the Ocean Dinas, the Kobe Henrys, who kind of developed elsewhere and came in to Orange County SC like it was a finishing school. Miles is their guy, and to see him be one of the best central defenders in the league so far and then get the goal, amazing stuff. So I think a lot of positives on both sides. Want some more spark from Orange County just to throw that out there, but they have the luxury of being able to ease in and know that, hey, you can always just pull off like any game winning streak in the summer. I mean, the kind of point out what you're talking about here, you know, you talk about Route 1 versus Colorado Springs. They completed or they attempted just over like 300 passes, and it felt like most of those were with their own center backs before they just tried to go long and, you know, kind of say boost down there somewhere. Um, and, you know, against, against Sacramento, really enough, it, it was a little bit more free flowing. Yes. Sacramento dominated the ball, but like, it felt like Miami, not comfortable, but they were, they were there. Um, to go from having just the, just over 300 passes versus Caro Springs to having over 400 versus uh, Orange County, that shows that, they, like you said, they're knocking around a little bit more. Mm -hmm. Unlike, and I say this because it works really well for Hartford. It works really, really well for Hartford. One thing that I noticed in watching Hartford early season is it's one two touch go out wide to your wings because you have Mitchell Galena and Deshaun Beckford and you can do that. But it's one touch, two touch, you know, one pass, two pass, go long. It's not that way for Miami. They seem like they can switch it up just a little bit, which I was very excited to see. And you invoked Andrew Booth. Shout out to his defensive solidity in the middle of the park for them. He's a player I kind of think of as a number 10. Like that was at least the rap on him coming up from Greenville. What he's done box to box this season, like the goal in the opener, sure, but solidifying in the middle of the pitch, unreal. And it's cool to see, right? Like it's the two Greenville guys that are the real yeah. standouts for Miami right now. I mean, it's always fun to see. I, And this is just another case of, and the USL championships gotten a lot better at this. So I, I, we're not, we're not screaming into the void as much as we were, but league one's legit. Like, I think fans need to stop just being like league one, lower league. Like the gap's not that far. Like Booth was really good in Greenville, but he wasn't a superstar in that league. And he is more than contributing at the championship level. I think that should tell you where that, where both leagues are right now. Well, if you think about this Miami side, Samuel Biak was an FC Tucson guy. Nico mm -hmm. Cardona was with Chatt uh, Chattanooga, right? Dalton mm -hmm. Knutson was yep. Tormenta. Gavilanis and Booth, we talked about. On the bench, they had Michael Vang, who was in there. Gabriel Freitas was a Tormenta guy, I want to say. Another Tormenta guy, yeah. Like, that's more than half a dozen players from Miami were born and bred in League One. That's amazing for this league. Not to mention, like last year, Jake McGuire was another league sure. one guy. Um, oh, did they? They had another. There was another league one guy that went down there. That was, I think, once again for minute. Like Miami tapped into that pipeline a little bit harder than everybody else, and I think they're finally starting to see a little bit of the fruit of the labor for it. Something I said last year when we, or earlier this off season, when we saw Miami kind of going to what they're doing right now. Mm -hmm. They paid a lot of money to get average results. They're paying not a lot of money right now to, if they're going to get the same results out of a lot less money, that's a win for ownership. If they're going to pay a lot less money for better results, I think, Hey, um, you know, was it, is it Ricardo, Ricardo Sanchez? Yeah. Is Ricardo that, Silva. It, Silva, thank you. Uh, Mr. Silva, hey, man, flashy name does not always equal good. Welcome to the sports. <laughs> like, you know, trusting your coaches to find the deep cuts. 
it's working out for them early doors. Every time I think about the fact that they paid seven hundred fifty thousand dollars <laughs> for Richie Ryan, it just makes less sense, and I cherish it always. I think it's funnier that it was Richie Ryan. <laughs> Richie Ryan at the time, like elite defensive midfielder in the NASL, but like it's Richie Ryan for a a fee that you would never see a USL team pay today. If a decade you later, almost I can I can tell you I can almost guarantee you this. If you were, if your team gets seven hundred fifty thousand dollars for a player, that number gets leaked. It's not the mysterious, <laughs> like could be up to six dig like figures. Like your team is announcing that, <laughs> right? I think that's a point of pride if you're getting that money. Yeah. Oh, uh, just incredible. Um, let's go ahead. I want to talk about league one just a little bit. We'll talk about Phoenix and Oakland in a second, but are you, I want are you to skipping about... Detroit Loudon? Are you just like, wait, no, I, I want to get, okay. I want to get into that. <laughs> I want to talk about Richmond Tormenta though. Yeah. That was, if you did, people just need to go back and watch that match. Unreal. Um, just how good of a match that was. And yes, my um, Johnny Dean is playing goalkeeper for Tormenta. The tweets will continue. Um, <laughs> I, <laughs> but seriously though, Ford Parker, if you have not been seeing what Ford Parker is doing in League One with Tormenta right now, it is unbelievable because Richmond probably should be walking away either with a draw or a win if it wasn't for what Ford Parker did in that match. I mean, Tormenta came out with the style where they really want to press you. Often that meant uh, moving Tavio de Almeida from the pivot higher upfield in the press. So you're leaving Connor Doyle alone as the single holding midfielder. I love Connor Doyle. He scores bangers for fun. Probably not the guy you want as the lone defensive presence protecting your back line. But hey, when Ford Parker is standing on his head like he did, just insane like that's something that this team's going to be able to rely on down the stretch and you do have to give credit to richmond playing the kids by the way uh nick yes. simmons a 17 year old jamaican uh was it griffin garnett in the midfield another yes. teenager from the academy amazing stuff we don't talk enough about how fun to watch neil vignoles is one of the most skillful players in League One for years on end. I went back and did the replay of this game catching up since the championship tends to kind of eat up my Saturdays. That game was worth the price of admission, just skill on both sides. I thought the late uh, substitution with Arthur Basawa coming on, I think making his debut for the kickers, he was immediately impactful at the number nine spot. The hold up play at the physicality nearly got ahead of goal. Really well played on both sides. The kind of game that makes you feel good about the hopes for both of these teams going forward. For sure. I I always end up watching Richmond, and I say always. Now I'm getting into, like, I, it wasn't fair with what happened in Detroit because Adrian Bilhart could have been a real superstar of the championship. He, I mean, I was noting him in the Open Cup game where it seems like his movement was just next level. Like, he's somebody who's thinking at a level that's above the USL championship. He's got the skill to pay that off. Definitely, it was weird for him in what was kind of a transition year, ultimately, in Detroit, where they couldn't settle on a system. Trevor James ended up being out the door. Cool to see him land back in Richmond, where he's going to be a difference maker. Let's talk about Detroit. Detroit walks away with a 2-1 win over the people's champ. And, I mean, Jop with a banger. Like, banger of all bangers. And then Faro, like, I... Yeah. He, here's, okay, here's one thing I will say about this with Faro. And this is something that, um, hashtag ad, if you listen to the Jake McGuire for the glove of the game, Something that he talked about a lot was refusing to pass on pressure to his defenders. Like, there was several times I asked him, I was like, you had a defender open, why did you kick it long? And he said, all I'm doing is passing on defenders. It's like, is, he basically says, becoming crisis avertant. 
you're just hoping somebody else makes the mistake. It felt like they kind of did that with Faro. Like, I don't think he should have that ball at his feet played to him. There, he, like, there's nowhere for him to go. He couldn't go back. Yep. Someone yep. there. He couldn't kick it long for obvious reasons of what happened. <laughs> Maxi Rodriguez eventually gets a deflection into what's happened. That was just a moment where Faro gets the. He gets the when playing it out of the back goes wrong, yeah. you know, highlight against him. But I don't really think that's him. Like, there's nothing he could have done. No, I think in a lot of ways it's systematic. Like, Loudon, even in game one against the San Antonio press, that was a lot harsher than Detroit's was on balance. Like, Loudon did not want to play a long ball in that game at all. And you saw that again, where just the tendency to pass, pass, pass at the back and try to play yourself out of trouble ultimately probably cost them two points out of, or rather three points out of this one. Like, you hate to see it, but you like the fact that Ryan Martin is going to stick to his guns and try to be consistent with how he wants that team to play. So credit in that sense, but definitely can't blame for a too much for the concession. Oh. Elvis Samo. I I think I said this last week, maybe, or I said it somewhere. Elvis Samo feels like what they missed from Hopano. Like there's mm. a there's an excitingness to him. There's also a grittiness that comes into his game that it just seems like and like Nicholas Murray is saying is like see where he was pre Hartford. I it's really interesting to see just kind of what he did, just a knack for being in the right place at the right time. It, I was kind of impressed with what he was doing defensively too. Like he was putting in some work, <laughs> um, you know, trying to win balls back. It, it felt like this is already a team that's already playing as a team with Detroit. I think on both sides, just watching this game, seeing the style, the way that they pass, the way that they move off the ball, this felt like one of the most technical games of USL soccer that I've maybe ever seen, which is a it's high compliment. There. It's up there. And when you're thinking about this, and no offense to the clubs, but it's Loudoun United in Detroit City, right? Like They've come out playing incredibly good soccer. And in that second half for Detroit especially, they sharpen their movement in a way where they just couldn't be stopped. And Amo was such a huge part of it, the way that he was dragging defenders out of shape, the way that whenever there was a turnover, he was committing in the counter press. I think he's an interesting guy just because he can contribute defensively, but you've got to feed him an attack or he's going to be a little bit disinterested. And that's how a lot of strikers are. So seeing him engaged like this right from the get-go is huge. Just, I mean, I'm loving everything about Detroit right now. And they've not even needed Steinwasher to like be Nate Steinwasher to get there already. So when push comes to shove and they're playing against the Charlestons and the Louisvilles, they have that extra level where, listen, you've got probably maybe the best goalie in the league right now with Nate Steinwasher on top of the fact that they've got a banging 10 outfield players in front of him really high on Detroit. I want to kind of go to Loudon just for a second. Yeah. I think a lot of people are going to look at underlying numbers and be like, they're not creating a lot. They're not doing this. They're not doing that. Their hot start's not sustainable. They're like, it's just like last year, Loudon. Despite their underlying numbers, when I say underlying numbers, typically you're looking at your XGs, your, you know, your expected goals, your expected assist, um, you know, just general like, press you know presses per defensive action or you know that kind of stuff right you're looking at that kind of stuff and saying is this sustainable compared to last year despite the underlying numbers not looking amazing for the output they're getting this looks sustainable this looks like this can be repeated and like you mentioned with zach martin he's going to sustain what he's doing because he's not changing it he doesn't care he is going to keep doing what he's doing and if anything, I think there's something to that in the fact that if it's not working, he'll find a player that makes the system work. Well, it's been interesting to see the way that like players like Wesley Leggett, who were nothing more than a super sub last year, have become key contributors. 
to the point that you didn't put Cristiano Francois right back in the lineup when he's back from red card suspension. That's a vote of confidence, but it shows the fact that there's depth here. And we've talked about it ad nauseum, but the difference between this Loudon team and the one that hasn't been able to sustain is the fact that you've got McCabe, you've got Skundrich, Erlinson and Hughes have been unreal at center back. There's a spine and a sense of, I don't know, control. Like these are error-free players in a lot of ways, and you've never seen that from Latin United before. So it makes you feel good going forward for Ryan Martin and co. I want to quickly, I mean, super quickly hit Loose City versus Pitt. Um, y- y- yikes. Out of pit. <laughs> I mean, look, all credit to Loose City. They look every bit of being the juggernaut that they are. They look like they are fully back back. But also, Jesus Christ, Pitt. Also, listen, I there. I want to just go ahead. I want to beat the allegations. Kizza is the guy who scored the three goals versus Birmingham in the playoff game, like you know, two years ago. <laughs> so before it comes off as salty Birmingham fan, yes, but also no. You, with how things have started for Pittsburgh, I don't think Kizza can taunt the Louisville faithful after scoring their first goal of the season. I will say <laughs> that Kizza was pro- maybe Pittsburgh's most engaged player, and I'm choosing my words carefully because I don't want to maybe say good, but like I think if you're Pittsburgh right now and anyone is taunting any fans, that's a bold choice. Like you want to have the confidence, but you got to back it up, and they are not backing it up. Uh, t- to what Connor Davis said, Bob Lee had a 25 minute conversation with the uh, team on the pitch. That's the shortest Bob Lilly conversation of all time. Yeah, that's um, a likely place for Bob Lilly to be. <laughs> <laughs> um, at times, Louisville looked like they were playing with their food especially the last goal. And you wrote about this um, hashtag ad, um, yeah. but it looked like they were playing with their food. <laughs> like, yeah. Well, I mean, well, for Pittsburgh, there was a 20, 25 minute stretch coming out of halftime where they really started to press. They got their teeth into the game a little bit. It felt competitive. And then Louisville realized wait our counter press is amazing ray serrano is tearing it up in the middle of the park they can't beat our center backs we can just grab this game by the uh, the and by the neck and really just take it to them it was encouraging to see this team find the goals there was maybe a lack of chemistry up front between serrano and harris and perez in that el paso game they could have got a couple more for me against the locomotive and by the time they were in the second 45 against Pittsburgh, they were clicking in a pretty meaningful way. It's hard for me to see a team that's clearly better than Lou City right now. Like They feel like they've got the players, they've got the system. This is the year that they're really going to reestablish the fact that we're Lou City, we're going to the conference final, and we're going to deserve it. Quickly, let's go over to Oakland Phoenix, where Phoenix finally looked like kind of last year's title run Phoenix where you mentioned Panos earlier where he looked unbelievable and Paul Blanchett is in Paul typical Paul Blanchett mode where he's just standing on his head and just stopping everything. You know, I feel how many times last year did we say, Oh, Oakland lost one nil. Paul Blanchett had like 12 saves. Like he's the wall. Yeah. (laughs) Like it's another game like that. I, Phoenix, I'll be honest. I, I know the questions we said earlier was where the goal is going to come from. I also trust that this team is going to create enough chances that goals will come, and they finally did. Oakland, a team that you said early on, you know, you mentioned the chameleon. They can kind of just form into anything. They barely created anything, and the only thing they created, none of them were on target. Like, are you like worried about Oakland at all, or is it just a were like it was just a one off thing? So Oakland last week got hit with some sort of illness, some sort of flu bug where half the lineup was out. This week they're missing Tamakas and Nabil Hackshaw with international duty. You have to put a Cam Riley, Daniel Gomez pivot is 
just not what you want to see if you're trying to move the ball at all. And the fact that they couldn't break Phoenix's press to save their life was kind of game over from the get-go in this one. And credit to Phoenix, who took full advantage. I think for Rising, the interesting thing offensively was the offense was more than just Panos and Rito on the right. Like, Armanakis was able to dish the ball out to Juan Azakar from that left wing back spot. Then Armanakis had the freedom to make those runs like you saw in the game-winning goal. If he can go and get into the box when Derek Formella just isn't doing that or Remy Cabral doesn't quite have the chemistry, that's going to give Rising that secondary scoring that they need to pay off the abundance of chances that they're creating. I think that for Phoenix, like that Monterey game where they really laid an egg was probably an aberration. This feels closer to the level for them. And it should have Rising fans feeling pretty good because I thought they looked immense. Yeah, I mean, to be fair, this is kind of what we saw in their first game versus Birmingham where they were creating chances like crazy. It was just where the goal's going to come from. And, you know, everything just felt like it was coming from a wide area. I mean, I mean, yeah, you mentioned Formella winger playing up top because he's a winger who's playing up top. Um, I It is hard. I mean, one as car. The fact that we're not saying Loney won as a car is kind of weird to me. I feel like that's <laughs> I that one's just weird, but you know, I mean, he's great. I love watching Juan. He is so much fun when he's on when he is himself. There's no one else like him in the league, and he's just so much fun. I mean, the fact that they've got Azakar and Rito back together after what they did in Oakland, like. That's going to be a weapon. Everybody knows that those two are in offense in and of themselves. So mm. really fun to see Azakar healthy and playing after whatever happened in San Antonio. Um, Nicholas Murray kind of put in there right now. Matt Van Oakle is going to be playing the Paul Blanchett role this season. 19 yeah. shots on target allowed by Legion have only conceded the one goal. Yes. <laughs> Just <laughs> that, That's insane. <laughs> gross um real fast um we might touch that one i don't know uh lexington one Knox. yes um you and i were not out on lexington but we did not have them as the consensus one seed when we did our usl league one show mm -hmm. and this is not us saying that lexington's a bad team by any stretch but i feel like the early cracks that we highlight on the show are very apparent right now. I, w I wrote a little bit about them last week in terms of the fact that they just aren't getting any offense from their right side right now. Like Tate Robertson has not been able to get the ball. They've not got Christian Young generating anything from the right back spot. Credit to Jorge Corrales, who really has been the one initiator simply lexington doesn't have the guns they need to distribute from the back and it's hurting them atestiv isn't getting touches he's got three shots all season the vermont green game was what it was but in the league they look pallid they look very almost disinterested in the press they're very much sitting back and kind of daring opponents to come at them they have the depth and the skill to go at teams and dictate the terms of a match, and they simply aren't doing that right now. Now, one Knox is probably a big reason why that happened over the weekend. They're a team that came out way better than I expected. Angelo Kelly Rosales has been a revelation in the forward line. Like he's playing this kind of right wing number eight fluid position, popping up between the lines, facilitating play. I think the interaction between their wingers and their wingbacks has been tremendous so far. Like Knoxville is doing everything right, but it's been frustrating to see Lexington kind of lay an egg to date. I, you know, it's not fully fair to talk on Darren Powell because I mean he has been the, well, I mean he when his time in the championship kind of was what it was it was consistent but it wasn't always good enough you know uh inner miami to whatever they end up calling them that it's a two team right and then he goes over to england he's with crystal palace it's with 
a U21 team. But at, there were times where we were making these same comments about his teams, though. Borderline disinterested. Like, didn't feel like they were fully clicking on things that they should be clicking on. I'm not saying that Powell is the problem. Because, I mean, our boots on the ground, when you talk to Tyler Crane uh, from mm-hmm. Crane Kicks Lex, he is all the way in. He could not be more in on Darren Powell. He's believing in the message that's being taught, which makes me think that it's there. But there is a bit of a pattern. He's somebody who we've talked a lot about progressive modern soccer on this episode. I don't think Powell is necessarily that guy. I think he's more likely to have you sit back, kind of prefer the long balls, prefer not to sell out in the press. When you're playing a team like Wad Knox, who's a little bit more up to it, it can bite you. So curious to see what adjustments come for Lexington, who on paper ought to be one of the top teams in this division. And we mentioned one Knox in our League One, uh, you know, in our League One show about how their offseason wasn't sexy. But I think we both kind of said there has to be a reason why they didn't really change anything. They surely they just believe from within. And early on, McKeever is proving us right and wrong and saying, yeah, the answer was already right here. Why would we need to spend more money when we spent it last season? It's already here. Yeah, I mean, they're starting eight or nine players who are returners from a team that was pretty mediocre, and the results have been night and day better. The additions have made a difference. Like, Sievert Hoagley has been a real steadier in the central midfield, which, hand up, I called him maybe the worst defender in the USL Championship when we did our season preview. So moving him into the midfield, inspired. Like, I think McKeever knew what he was doing, and clearly it's paying off so far. Um, just so I can give love to Hartford because Hartford deserves a ton of love right now. They win one nil over Birmingham Legion. The, the one thing I put on Twitter, I put it in our discord, um, check out our discord. They had, uh, an XCG an ex- expected completed goals, which basically means if it's on target, it's more like, that's kind of what you're looking at. For example, they say an XG of a of a of a penalty kick is 0.76, but if it's on frame, it has an 86 percent chance of going in. So basically, if it's on target, it has a better chance of going in. They calculate it that way. Basically, if the goalkeeper wasn't there, would the goal have gone in? You know, that's kind of what they're calculating. Their XCG on shots that were put on target, they had a 5.13. They were expected to score five goals in that game and put it down to bad finishing, Matt Van Oakle standing on his head, whatever. Who cares if they just got one? It looked like a horrible, rainy, cold night in Hartford. That was an unbelievable, unreal offensive performance. Just an unreal offensive performance from Hartford. When you think about the fact that Romario Williams was gone with the Jamaica national team and they're starting like teenager Mamadou Jiang, like that makes the performance that much more impressive to see. Uh, I mean, what you got out of Beckford and Galena on the wings was simply ridiculous. Like, I actually thought Birmingham came with a fairly considerate approach to how they wanted to defend that team. And you can point to errors for sure from the Legion, but what Hartford was doing on the wings, you could have put them against Man City and they would have got some results. Like those players are cooking at a level that is utterly ridiculous right now. Hartford is going to be so dangerous. Yeah, I I think one thing that I got to mention here is Maji Marana, who was the right back, uh, right wing back for Birmingham Legion. I can't think of a much worse time to get your first professional appearance than having to go against Michigalina. That should that's be messed up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> that's messed up. <laughs> and we got to give credit to the team of the week player from Hartford here in Anderson Asiadu, who uh, clearly sure. came out came out just passionate. He was dominating the central midfield. I, you can talk on that, but I was happy to see him really have a banger of a game. 
the scoop assist was gross. Disgusting. <laughs> like I it was unbelievably good. Um Anderson almost had a real nice goal. Matt Van Okel denied him as well. I mean, Anderson was a was distributing the ball well, just defensively, just great, connecting the play so well. It sucks to be on this side of it, but also it's so nice to just see him playing again. I think a lot of the USL forgot just how good Anderson Asedu is, and he showed it. And I'm just saying, maybe it was Legion not letting him fully spread the wings. He didn't have that kind of assist in his locker last year, and if that's what Brendan Burke is going to be getting out of him this year, fool. Yeah, I mean, I, I think that's sort of the beauty of putting two kind of – number six, number eight players next to each other is that they've got that give and take. And Asiru clearly feels pretty liberated to, like you said, spread his wings and kind of be creative, which, hey, if he's got it in his bag, let him do it. Yeah, no kidding. Um, yeah, it was just a fun match. I I don't want to... This is not to me being too salty or anything like that. Like, I, I do want to say that outright. It's kind of hard for me to tell what went fully wrong on the Birmingham side mm -hmm. because a lot of the things that I was looking for, the cameras just weren't picking it up. Like, you know, like they didn't have as many camera angles as you would want. So like if I, you know, sometimes they show alternate views of certain things and they just didn't have that. So it's hard for me to really get into the weeds of what Birmingham was doing wrong, but boy, were they showing what Hartford were doing right. Just unbelievable. That's my big takeaway from this game for sure. Um, let's go ahead and predict some matches. Why don't we? Um, just fun stuff. What are you doing, what? dummy? Oh, God. you got a nice, nice audible meow there. <laughs> he, he gets the zoomies at about 9 p.m. and 5 30 in the morning every other time he is just asleep Ooh. and having a blast like just sleeping Cat for you. yeah <laughs> he's as sweet as can be D but god bless him um let's go ahead and get into these predictions why don't we let's start off with phoenix versus new mexico phoenix you know gets their finishing boots on in new mexico well they got shellacked can they respond yeah, I mean, a nice Southwestern rivalry game here. New Mexico is still a team that I believe in, even though clearly I thought that uh, Charleston kind of had their number. The question for me is, is Phoenix able to sell out and shut down Micheletto and Bailey as those deep-lying creators without kind of sacrificing their shape and throwing off their own offense? Ultimately, I lean yes, and I think Phoenix does win this game. I think it's going to be a real litmus test for both of these teams, though. I agree. I think we're going to learn a lot about these teams, even if it ends in a draw. I think that we are going to learn a lot about both clubs. I'm taking New Mexico, and it's not really just uh, New Mexico bounce back and Phoenix falls back down to earth. I don't think that at all. I just think that what New Mexico brings is going to challenge Phoenix a little bit more, and even Phoenix struggled with what they were getting out of uh, Oakland kind of back at new mexico in that charlotte versus spokane spokane has already been kind of talked about in our discord chat of like hey they are for real like a lot of people are like yo they are scared and we think they'll be charlotte not really fitting the bill of league one runner-up from last year where are you feeling charlotte a bit odd they've only played once and it was against a knox team that might be a weapon I, I've only seen Spokane really play a full game against Ballard in the Open Cup, and Ballard kind of took it to them. I know I need to get hit the tape a little bit more with Spokane, but I think this is the game where Charlotte kind of establishes the fact that, listen, we're here. We were in the final last season. We've got most of that team back. We're going to get a win in this game and set the tone. For me, I'm taking Spokane because they just haven't, played or charlotte hasn't played as much weirdly i feel like spokane's more into the flow of the season at this point dolling uh, he's been okay for me it kind of is what it is with him louise hill is ridiculous um 
just absolutely ridiculous. And Lewis and Denton have been mm. an incredible just, you know, holding midfield pairing that if Charlotte is not quite up to the true match fitness quite yet, those two are going to be a handful. I kind of lean Spokane for that win. Um, next I will up, say real quick that I'm a lifelong Andre Lewis fan club, and I love to see the king getting his starts. Yes. Um, let's go ahead and go to the all green Darby. Uh, there's a name. It's the geo Tyler Darby. Yeah. Um, it's, uh, I mean, Oh, I, I mean, it's Lex Luthor versus the, the best hair in the game. Um, Lexington sputtering <laughs> and Greenville looks solid. I'm really happy with what Greenville is doing early on. Greenville looked stifling against forward Madison. Like defensively, they're as good as they're ever going to be. I think this is maybe the game where we're going to, like, we got Zion Scarlett get, having the breakout in week one. I think either him, Ben Zikowski, Mohamed Say, one of those young forwards is going to have himself a night. I don't trust Powell to make the right changes quite yet. Like, I think that this team needs to dig themselves a little bit more of a hole before they make the corrections. So I'm going triumph outright. Me too. Um, you know, the one or the nil nil draw against Ford Madden, you know, you can say, well, they didn't really create Greenville didn't really create a whole lot. Their XG is inflated by a miss by a miss penalty. They forced Ford Madison to not do anything. Mm-hmm. And versus a Lexington team who has not done anything <laughs> in terms of creating chances except for their, you know, whatever they did in the Open Cup. That was just pure vibes. I I think that this Greenville defense alone is going to lock down Lexington. I'm taking Greenville. Were they my lock? They were not my lock. Um, came close, though. Um, Tampa Bay versus Rhode Island. Tampa Bay, hey, like they look like they can be dangerous. And we talked about it last week. Forrest Lasso looks like he's Forrest Lasso again. Going against Rhode Island, who gets a 2-2 draw against Monterey, but this is not your preseason Monterey. Monterey looks like they are for real. Tampa Bay, Tampa Bay Rhode Island. What I say? You started talking about Monterey. Oh, never mind, never mind. I got the drift. I zoned yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll recap to do the preview. Yeah, yeah. I'm getting confused because we got some maybe have Monterey coming up in these predictions. So oh, yeah, 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 yeah. I got my zone switched. But in any event, Tampa yeah. Bay against North Carolina, a team that presses in a 3-4-3 that is not dissimilar from Rhode Island's, they held the Rowdies to 0.2 expected goals last week. Tampa Bay just could not break them down. Granted, they did get a goal from like the one sequence where they were able to get Lewis Hilton dictating play from the middle. We're going to need to see more of that. Rhode Island, the big question mark is Coke Vegas's health after the injury at the end of the game on Sunday night. Even without him, I think that they're really well set up to go and win this game. I think they're motivated to finally get that first win on the books. I'm going to Rhode Island pretty confidently. Don't forget what Jackson Lee is, by the way. I mean, Jackson yeah, Lee was a, a first-round pick goalkeeper mls teams don't take goalkeepers in the first round like he's real <laughs> and when they do they go and sign hugo loris and then release the guy yeah <laughs> <laughs> i mean if it's me i mean you know who i'm taking and it's not hugo L- loris but whatever yeah. um <laughs> but i mean forest lasso i mean we talked about it last week forest lasso like forest lasso again like yeah, I Tampa Bay looked okay and the, like they looked good defensively for me, but yeah. man, Rhode Island just presents <laughs> such a different tactical approach than you're going to see in a lot of the league. Like you can do as mm-hmm. much film study as you want; they are just bizarre to watch in the best way possible. Um, I have to pull this one up. I went with Tampa Bay. And it's for no other reason than Tampa Bay is at home. Like, it just feels like they can't. Al Lang just feels like one of those places that they just don't lose. No, that's fair. 
Um, you mentioned it. I now, we got yeah. there. San Antonio versus Monterey Bay. San Antonio. Hey, they're doing their thing. You know, mentality. They're they're all about the mentality, as we all know. Uh, Colorado Springs, they beat them 2-0. They kind of continue from there, come from behind uh, Tampa Bay game. Meanwhile, like I mentioned, this is not your preseason Monterey. Monterey looks <laughs> really freaking good. Um, this is going to be a real interesting one to see how these two bite it out. I'm so excited for this matchup. I think... Monterey Bay, the way that they're able to have their midfielders control the game, that Baca, Fair, uh, uh, Adrian Rebelar trio, that's going to do a lot to beat the new look San Antonio. You're going to need a good performance from that back line. You had the gaffe, right, where Guzman and Kai Green just couldn't quite handle Everett Dequa twice over, and it made the difference to ultimately lead to a draw. I think I trust San Antonio to really try to make a statement here. So that's not to disparage Monterey Bay, who I'm 100% in on, but I have San Antonio getting this win. If you look at our uh, predictions that we put in our Discord, I put Monterey with a question mark. Um, yeah. I'm, <laughs> I'm like not really sure because I trust in what San Antonio is doing. Uh, there is something to be said about long-term success. It's the same reason we just kind of blindly trust Lou City good. Like it's the same reason why we blindly trust Bob Lilly good, and why the beginnings of the season for Pittsburgh are so shocking for us. Right until Marcina and Co. prove to me that they're bad, it's hard for me not to trust. Right, but God, Monterey Bay looked so good. <laughs> I'm taking Monterey Bay because I feel like what they're doing is sustainable. I feel like it can be repeated, and I'm really intrigued to see what it is. This is my personal game of the week. I'm, I think I'm probably with you on that, yeah. Yeah, this is a good one. This this and uh, Knoxville Tormenta I'm excited for. Knoxville Tormenta, I'm excited to see if Tormenta can really con continue, especially with Coley gone. I know he was gone before, yeah. but also – or will he be back? Or, I, I know, know. He's, not, he's on international. If yeah. he's back, he's going to get limited play time. But, you know, that's going to be an interesting one. That's going to be – that one's fun too. Can I just shout out Philip, or he goes by Ajmir apparently, Ajmir Spengler, who is ridiculously good on the wing for Tormenta. He got a really nice goal or maybe an assist against Charleston in that preseason friendly right before the year started. Mm -hmm. He got an assist in their latest game. He's on fire so far. Yeah, that, he's unbelievable. Another just much watch. Uh, Shadow Wolf, uh, we've already done the Phoenix, uh, New Mexico. Just go back just a little bit. It will be in there. Um, Yeah, there's a lot of good stuff going on right now. Just yeah. so much good stuff around the league. Um, Yeah, lots of that we talked about. Heavy hitter of an episode. Um, so, yeah. I uh, Final thoughts for the night, unless you have another USL? No, I got nothing more USL-wise. Uh, final thoughts. Been a busy stretch for me. Just been trying to chill, uh, keep it up with Shogun. Started back into the revival of the old uh, anime X-Men animated series on Disney+. Plus. They brought that back from the grave, and... I don't know if it's like good necessarily, but it's like comfort food. So enjoying that. Yeah, it's kind of like um I I know sometimes we just kind of put on like reruns of friends and stuff like that. Right. I don't actually watch it. It's just background sound because it's there and I just kind of it it's there for me. Yeah, I mean this is like like I've read the comics, I watched the old series, like just seeing this stuff. Like I know where it's going already. So it's just like I zone out and I'm watching, but not really. Fair. Yeah. No, I need to watch Shogun. I always tell myself I need to watch Shogun yeah. and I still haven't watched it, but I need to watch it. But also need to watch both Dune and Dune 2 because I feel really left out. 
you kind of miss the cycle on Dune too. So if you just hold strong for a little bit more, you're going to be good. See, I kind of did the same thing with, with Ted Lasso. I still haven't yeah. seen it. And I I feel like the the wave is gone, so I've forgotten that I haven't watched it, and then I'm just like, ah, oh, I need to watch yeah, it. Yeah, like the statute of limitations is passed. Like you don't have to do it anymore. Yeah, true. Um, let's see, my interesting oh, um tomorrow at I don't have to teach band or Spanish because I have been voluntold to play it in a volleyball game. <laughs> this is the most school like you're teaching kids thing ever <laughs> yeah they were like they walked up to me and they were like hey we're red tomorrow and i was like is it red ribbon week yes. like what's going on they're like no you're playing the senior boys in a volleyball game and i'm like why am i doing that and they're like because we raised money for the library and i'm like we did what <laughs> <laughs> Well, you've got the height. You're going to be spiking it in these kids' faces. Some of those kids can dunk. I'm screwed. That's a good point. <laughs> yeah, senior in high school, like, you've lost the athletic edge at that point. Like, they're in their athletic prime, and I'm just not. <laughs> yeah, arguably, I've never had an athletic prime. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. Oh, I love – okay, so Nicholas Murray's watching uh, – See, I understand. I understand the Ben Clemens comment, but I just haven't watched it. Uh, <laughs> New Zealand versus England uh, cricket. I I love cricket. I watch so much cricket in my free time. I'm watching baseball and cricket. If someone's filming it, I might try to get a video and see. Like, if I fall on my face, there will be a video of it somewhere. So that'll be posted <laughs> eventually. Yeah, on um, some high schoolers TikTok. Uh, I've already been there. Um, <laughs> yeah. Oh, speaking of tomorrow, soccer down here, 10 a.m. It's we'll we'll be on there and talking about ATL stuff. So yeah, yeah. never been a better time to ch- uh, tune in to an Atlanta centric show, people. To be fair, they do a really good job of not just being so Atlanta. Oh, they're great. They're like, great. I, it's still they're great. Yeah, but yeah. That's about it. Don't forget, people. Um, send good vibes to Alan and Ryan. Um, you know, check out what Phil just posted on uh, Twitter um, with with Malloy and stuff like that. Just he saw the vision as um, Charleston pointed out. And remember, people, for one last time tonight, we can be bought. We can be bought the USL show at gmail.com. Um, reach out. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all so much. And, you know, here for the first time and final time tonight, here's Alan's voice. Thank you for watching another episode of the USL show. The USL show is now proudly part of the protagonist podcast family. Please go to protagonistsoccer.com to check out more work. Thanks for stopping by. We'll see everyone again next time.